Welcome everybody to Southern Maryland Audubon and our program on the amazing plant insect bird food web with the even more amazing Dr. Ashley Kennedy as our speaker. I'm Molly Moore. I'm president of Southern Maryland Audubon. We're a chapter of National Audubon and are dedicated to the protection and appreciation of birds, wildlife, and their habitat in Southern Maryland and beyond. Our monthly presentations are free and open to everyone. If you aren't yet a member of our flock and would like to join us, we welcome you enthusiastically. You can join at southernmarylandaudubon.org. You can also check out all of our free field trips and other events on the website. I am thrilled to introduce Dr. Ashley Kennedy, who's been an extraordinarily, um, uh, has an extraordinarily impressive resume and breadth of knowledge. She's currently with uh, the Fish and Wildlife Department of the state of Delaware and is current president of the Entomolo Entomological Society of America's Eastern Branch. Dr. Kennedy received her PhD in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware in 2019. Her dissertation research in Dr. Doug Tallamy's lab focused on bird insect food webs, investigating which insect groups are most important to breeding birds. And many of you know that uh, uh, Dr. Tallamy is an icon in the gardening and master gardener and naturalist world these days. So after graduation, Dr. Kennedy uh, completed a postdoctorate fellowship in the Tick-Borne Disease Laboratory at the Army Public Health Center in Maryland. She began her current role as an environmental scientist uh, with the state of uh, Delaware in 2020. Dr. Kennedy studied vervet monkeys for her undergraduate uh, thesis research at John Hopkins University and completed internships and seasonal positions at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center here in Maryland, which many of us are very familiar with, the National Zoo in Washington, DC, and the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute in Virginia between her undergraduate and graduate studies. She's a past board member of Delaware Audubon, a science policy fellow at the Entomological Society of America, a 2018 recipient of the John Henry Comstock Graduate Student Award and a board certified entomologist with a specialty in medicinal and veterinary entomology. Dr. Kennedy, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And now let the show begin. Thank you so much, you're, <laughs> you're too kind. Um, and I wanted to thank you for the invitation to be here tonight. Uh, I'll apologize in advance. Uh, it's been a few years since I wrapped up this research and I'm also a little bit jet lagged because I just got back this morning from a, a two week trip to Kenya where I got to see some really cool birds. Uh, so I'm gonna try and keep it together, but that, that's my preemptive apology. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the work I did when I had the opportunity to be a graduate student in Doug Tallamy's lab as Molly was saying. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about what I learned about bird insect food webs. Um, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and dive right in. Um, you've probably seen going back the past few years, uh, headlines like this one about the insect apocalypse or uh, catastrophic insect declines. So uh, back in November, 2018, the New York Times Magazine published this article, uh, which basically summarized 73 independent reports of insect declines around the globe. And this is something that people have even been able to notice just on an anecdotal basis. Uh, if you're driving down a country road in the summertime, uh, you know, a few decades ago, you'd have to scrape off your windshield pretty well at the end of it. But these days, that's not uh, as necessary. So this headline says, a car splatometer study finds huge insect die off. And that was in 2020. Uh, and then here's one from the Guardian in 2021. It says insect populations suffering death by a thousand cuts, say scientists. So many different drivers behind this decline. And I'm going to share one last article. This is from The Onion, which is, of course, satire. Um, it says, ecologists urge birds to avert global decline of insects by adopting seed-based diet. So yeah, it's not meant to be serious, but like most articles from The Onion, it does have at least a, an undercurrent of truth to it. And that's why the, the humor works. 
uh, because the truth is insects really are enormously important in birds' diets. Uh, here's one more um, from The Guardian, December 2020. Mass die-off of birds in southwestern U.S. was caused by starvation. Um, so we've seen that insect declines can be tied to bird declines. Here's one more. Um, in 2019, a study came out saying that North America has lost 3 billion birds uh, over the past 50 years. So uh, sorry to deluge you with these really uh, depressing headlines. I promise things will pick up in a little bit. Uh, but here's one from the Washington Post. It says, one million species face extinction and humans will suffer as a result. So when we talk about these declines in insects and in birds and in other wildlife, it's not just a wildlife problem. It, it really will become a human problem as well. Uh, because, and I quote here, the decline in biodiversity is eroding the foundations of our economies, livelihoods, food security, health, and quality of life worldwide. So the State of the Birds report in 2016, which is around when I was starting this research, uh, said that 432 species of North American birds were at risk of extinction. So that, that's a pretty alarmingly high percentage. We have, I mean, you, you might know better than I, but you know, give or take a thousand species in North America. So this is more than a third of them. And we understand what the major drivers are behind that decline. So number one is going to be habitat loss and that goes hand in hand with habitat degradation. So even where green spaces still exist, they're not as high quality as they used to be. Um, feral and domestic cats kill millions of birds each year. And then lastly, uh, collisions uh, with buildings and with vehicles and uh, wind turbines and uh, other man-made structures uh, contribute to this high mortality. So uh, kind of the root of my project was I wanted to come up with a way to um, help bird conservation and we wanted to kind of get back to the basics and think what do birds need to survive? Well, just like everything they need, or just like all wildlife, they need food. So uh, we've known for a long time that birds eat insects. That wasn't any startling new revelation. Uh, and in fact, if you're just flipping through Peterson Field Guide, um, you'll find that 96% of uh, North American terrestrial birds featured in that guide, uh, rear their young on insects. So this is important because even birds that you might think of as being uh, seed eaters or fruit eaters, um, you know, for example, the, the species that will come to your bird feeder and enjoy bird seed, um, even those species do heavily depend on insects during at least one crucial part of their life cycle. So when, they're, uh, when it's the breeding season and they have to rear their young and you know, insects really deliver the, the perfect combination of protein and fats and micronutrients that birds need to develop from a just hatched hatchling uh, to a fledgling. So my project aimed to try and figure out which insect groups are the most important. Uh, because if we knew that, it would help us to create and maintain better habitat for birds. And what I'm getting at here is that uh, not all insects are equal. They all have different requirements for their survival and reproduction. So many insects um, are herbivores. The majority of insects are herbivores. And of those herbivores, about 90%, it's a rough estimate, are host specialists, which means that they depend on a particular plant lineage to survive and reproduce. So I have a picture here of a monarch and milkweed. That's kind of the, the classic example. Um, but it's not an exception to the rule, it really is the rule. Um, so most insects do have this tight knit evolutionary relationship with a host plant. And it might not be as specific as just, you know, one insect species per, you know, or tied down to one plant species. It might be a genus of plants or a family of plants, you know, a group of closely related plants. But the, the point is that insects can't, by and large, most insects cannot just eat whatever is growing in your garden. They have, they have specific requirements. So if we could figure out which insects are the most important in bird diets, we can then turn that around and make sure that we're planting the plants that those insects need to survive. So I wasn't the first person to look at 
the relationship between birds and insects. So I'm gonna go over some of the past studies methodology uh, and their shortcomings. So in the past, one a common avenue for determining bird diet was to put a ligature or neck collar um, on um, hatchlings, uh, nestlings, and that um, prevented them from swallowing the food parcel. So the researcher could then come by and collect the food out of their mouths. Um, so this is obviously rather intrusive and it needs to be done just right or you risk uh, harming or even killing the bird. So this is not something I was interested in doing. Um, there's also fecal analysis. So just essentially that's you know combing through the bird's fecal matter, trying to find the undigested remains of their prey. And this works well for some insect groups, but not all of them. So for example, beetles have those really hard outer wings called elytra. Those tend to remain undigested and can show up in fecal matter. But if you think of something that's completely soft and squishy, like a caterpillar, that's not going to leave much of a trace. So this is going to give you overestimates of some groups and underestimates of others. You can also just cut a bird open and look directly into its gut to see what it's eating. Obviously, that necessitates sacrificing the birds, which uh, since the whole um, driving influence for this study was bird conservation, I wasn't interested in doing that either. Uh, and then um, a more recent method is molecular scatology. So again, you're collecting the bird's fecal matter, but this time, um, instead of just visually trying to identify the undigested bits, you're actually doing DNA analysis. Um, now the downside for this technique is that it's it's costly, um, it's very labor intensive. Um, and at the time that I was starting my research in 2015, um, it really wasn't developed uh, to the point where it was a, a viable option. You know, most insects um, you know, have not had their genome sequenced. So I wouldn't necessarily even yield um, meaningful data. So my advisor, Doug Tallamy, uh, it sounds like everyone's familiar with in this group. Um, he is a fantastic photographer. So I think that gave him the idea that photography could be uh, the best means of getting at this data. Because if you have a lovely photo of a bird with its arthropod prey, such as this one, uh, well, it gives you an unambiguous record. So anyone looking at this picture won't be able to argue with me when I say that Eastern bluebirds eat crab spiders. Um, it's non-invasive. I have heard people say that the presence of a photographer can subtly influence bird behavior, but compared to putting a ligature around their neck or cutting their gut open, uh, you know, it's pretty harmless. Um, and it is relatively inexpensive. It, cameras are getting uh, cheaper and smaller all the time. So I get a kick out of this old picture, <laughs> this old advertisement that someone sent me. Uh, a videotape recorder that goes anywhere you go. Um, no, luckily I did not have to shinny up any trees lugging this like behemoth of a, <laughs> of a video camera. I was able to use um, tiny little GoPro cameras, which were much less invasive. So my, my focal species, the species that I spent most of the, my time on uh, was the Eastern Bluebird for several reasons. One is it's highly insectivorous, so I knew I would be able to capture photos of it, uh, of bluebirds with insect prey. Um, it's easy to find their nest. So again, I wasn't going up into the trees. I just had to um, find a site that had a pre-existing network of bluebird boxes because they are, of course, cavity nesters. Uh, and then in Delaware, they have two broods a year. So typically one in April or May, and then another one in July or August. Uh, so I knew that I would be able to have a nice long field season and get lots of data. Um, and then perhaps most importantly of all is they habituate quickly to human visitation. So uh, as you can see from this photo, um, the birds would resume their normal foraging behavior just moments after I set up the camera each morning. So I'm still walking away and the bird's already back to business. So my field site was uh, this beautiful um, nature center. It's called Mount Cuba Center in Hocassin, Delaware. Um, parts of it are maintained as a um, botanic garden. 
Um, and it's definitely worth a visit if you've never been. Um, but my study took place on what are called the natural lands. So they are minimally managed. They do mow a couple times a year and then they do invasive species management. But it's basically as pristine a natural habitat as you'll be able to find in Newcastle County, Delaware. So again, I was using these little cameras, GoPro Hero 3s. Um, I would set them up right on the top of the, the post to which the bluebird boxes were attached. Um, and so the birds would typically alight on the roof just before going into the, the nest hole. So that gave me an opportunity to get photos with the prey. Um, now they're not uh, camera traps, so they're not motion activated. So that was one downside, but you can set them to just take photos on a time lapse. So I set them to take one photo per second, which as you can imagine generates a lot of photos that are not necessarily useful. So I would get about 25,000 photos per nest per day. And most of them just showed um, you know, the, the scenery, the, the trees, the field, no birds. Uh, but even after deleting all the photos that didn't have birds on them, that left me with thousands um, that were more useful. So I recorded 12 bluebird, bluebird broods in the first summer, 16 in the second summer, and 10 in the third and final summer. So over, over the course of those three years, um, I had about 10 million photos to go through, and many of those were repeats of the same uh, feeding event. So I refer to uh, a bird bringing back a prey item as a, a feeding event. So. Um, but all told, there were more than 8,200 prey that were captured um, by this method. And the photos were clear enough that I was able to identify 93% um, of them to the ordinal level or below. So that's a, a pretty broad grouping. Um, you know, I was able to tell, for example, this is a caterpillar, this is a beetle, um, but a subset of them around um, 40% I was able to get to the family level and then about 15 or 20% um, to genus and species. So here's a snapshot of what the birds were eating. Um, so you can see that the, the light green piece of pie um, represents Lepidoptera. So that's caterpillars as well as adult moths and butterflies. Um, and then the next biggest group was Orthoptera. That's the crickets, grasshoppers, and katydids, and that made up a quarter of the diet. Um, spiders made up just about 20%. Um, the next biggest was the only non-arthropod group, and that was earthworms at about 5% of the diet, followed by beetles at 3%. Um, all other insect groups, um, or I should say other arthropod groups, because it also includes millipedes and uh, pill bugs and so forth. Um, they made up 6% and then berries and other plant material made up just under 1%. So here's kind of just in a nutshell what they were eating, but I'm going to share some of the photos from that project. So starting with the most important group, the Lepidoptera. Uh, you can see um, from this variety of photos that um, most commonly the birds would go after smooth green caterpillars. Um, and it was more uncommon to see them bringing back a particularly spiny or uh, dark or brightly um, like aposematically colored caterpillar. And this just kind of makes sense intuitively because a green caterpillar, a smooth green caterpillar is depending on camouflage as its main anti-predator defense. So it doesn't have any toxins uh, or any spines or hairs that would make it unpalatable to the bluebird. So as, as long as they're able to spot it, it really is uh, a perfect food item for them. Uh, but, but there were exceptions. You can see um, a lot of different caterpillar families are represented here. The next biggest group was Orthoptera. Um, so here are a couple examples of that. Right, sorry, one second. Sorry, that was my cat causing trouble. Um, <laughs> There's a Katie did uh, and a differential grasshopper shown here. I, I love that photo because it looks like the grasshopper is you know, contemplating its fate. Uh, then here's some more variety. Uh, the thing that surprised me the most in this group was the bluebirds um, did find some mole crickets. So for example, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor, but oops, um, this middle photo and the second row and then the, um, 
the leftmost one in the third row. So those are mole crickets and they spend most of their lives underground burrowing like moles. And I um, have rarely noticed or encountered them myself. So I was just impressed that the, the birds were able to home in on them and, and find them uh, so readily. So spiders were the third biggest group and this included not just web spinners or um, orb weavers, but um, crab spiders, wolf spiders, um, uh, jumping spiders. So again, um, a, a really astonishing diversity. And I'll give them kudos because uh, <laughs> these bluebirds are picking up spiders that I would even be a little uncomfortable to have that close to my face. And, and I'm a lot bigger than a bluebird. Um, and then I'll go through the other arthropod groups um, or the other prey groups in declining order of importance. So earthworms, again, made up about 5%. These are mostly uh, invasive earthworms. Beetles, uh, both larval and adult beetles made up about 3% of the diet. Um, the true flies, the order Diptera made up about 1%. Those were mostly uh, all crane flies. Um, plant matter made up less than 1%, um, as did praying mantises. Although if I could have found a way to uh, measure this in terms of mass as opposed to frequency, I expect their, their representation would shoot way up because some of the praying mantises that the bluebirds brought back to their young were enormous. Um, the true bugs, the order Hemiptera, which includes stink bugs and cicadas and squash bitted bugs, um, made up about one half of 1%. Um, then there is uh, Hymenoptera, which is wasps, bees, and flies. So I know it's kind of hard to make out, but in that bottom right photo, um, this female bluebird has just a bill full of a bunch of winged ants that must have just emerged all at once. Um, and then we have the centipedes and millipedes, um, and then even dragonflies, which um, are you know very strong flyers. So again, that's impressive. And this study actually yielded the first recorded observation of a bluebird feeding on an immature dragonfly. And that was really interesting because uh, immature dragonflies are aquatic, so you would only find them, you know, in streams or in ponds. Or as I think what happens here. Um, is that this immature dragonfly had just decided, you know, it was time to grow up and it had just finally crawled out of the water and was ready to uh, eclose as an adult. Um, and it got snatched up um, after, you know, probably based on the, this species, it was probably underwater for three to five years evading predation. So it just had really, really bad luck to not quite make it to the next stage. Um, but I think that's more likely than the bird actually uh, foraging in the water because I don't think that's been uh, observed for this species. Um, pill bugs or isopods made up a, a teeny tiny percentage, um, as did slugs and snails. Uh, and then lastly, there were seven um, out, out of the 8,200 prey items, there were seven that actually represented um, frogs and one snake. So this was also the first observation of an eastern bluebird. Um, foraging on, uh, it turned out to be a juvenile northern brown snake. So I, I was gathering all these pictures of birds eating caterpillars, and I was really excited uh, because it was, you know, they, it, was, it seemed like they had a clear preference for caterpillars, at least that was how I, I was starting to interpret it. And Dr. Tallamy uh, intervened and re reminded me that I wasn't being a, a good scientist. And he said, well, you know, you don't know that the birds actually prefer caterpillars just because they're eating a lot of them. Like you would have to actually design a test to test that before you can make that claim. Because, you know, for all you know, they're just eating caterpillars because that's uh, the most available or the most ubiquitous insect in the environment. So, you know, that made me scratch my head and think, how could I actually prove that they prefer caterpillars over other groups? So uh, I did a lot of research and what actually turned out to be helpful was uh, some papers from the pet food industry because they have to assess um, animals' feeding preferences without obviously uh, you know, being able to talk to them and just ask them to take a survey. So there's uh, in the pet food industry, there's something called a paired stimulus preference assessment or a versus test where you're testing you know, 
food type A versus food type B, which one does the animal prefer? So I have a picture here of my dog just to show how this test works. So let's say I've got two brands of dog food here um, and I offer him an equal amount of each type of food and they're equally accessible, you know, presented to him at the same time in the same amount. Uh, what I could do is uh, first choice analysis, which is which food does he go to first? Because um, regardless of how nutritious or how tasty the food is, uh, it, the, whichever one he goes to first, we can make an assumption that it was more attractive on some level. And then also you can do a preference ratio analysis. So you can measure the volume of food type A that was consumed uh, compared to the volume of food type B. Now, my dog is a glutton, so I can assure you that he would eat every last morsel of both types of food. And so the preference ratio analysis wouldn't yield any uh, meaningful data. Uh, and that's actually what happened with the bluebirds too. Um, I, I gave them choices of different types of insects to eat and they ate all of them. Um, but I was able to use the first choice analysis to assess which ones were their favorite. So I had five types of insects that I used in these trials. So cabbage loopers, which are smooth green caterpillars, wax worms, which are a different type of caterpillar that looks almost more like a grub, like they're um, like chubby white, um, like little, yeah, they look almost grub-like to me, but they are uh, moth caterpillars. Uh, crickets, mealworms, which are larval beetles, and stink bugs. And I chose these five insects partly because of the taxonomic breadth that they represent, so five different types of insects, uh, but also because they were the ones that were easiest to get in the bulk quantities that I needed for this experiment. Um, so I was able either to purchase them from biological supply companies or from pet stores, or in the case of the stink bugs, I was able to just go around to my friends' houses and basically vacuum them up. You know, nobody seemed to mind that I was taking them. A fun anecdote here, uh, my university purchasing card got flagged for uh, suspicious activity um, and they, someone in, in some fiscal office thought that I was buying thousands of caterpillars for personal use as opposed to my research use. So I don't know if they thought I was sauteing them up for, for my own like stir fry at home, uh, but I, I promised that they did all go to the birds. Um, so I would put out 12 insects in any given trials. So there'd be six of one type of insect and six of another type. I'd set up the GoPro to record what happened. Uh, and I was trying to control for things like um, the availability, you know, they're all um, set up at the same time and in, in pairs, they would be an even distance from the bird wherever they landed on the roof. Um, I tried to make them evenly sized, at least as best as I could um, eyeball them. And then, uh, so the GoPros would take pictures like this one of the birds coming along and picking out their, their favorite foods. So I did this with 23 pairs of bluebirds. I did 270 trials in total. Um, and again, they would eat pretty much all the insects. So I wasn't able to compare the volume um, that was consumed, uh, but I did look at which ones they ate first. So the wax worms, so that's that grub-like caterpillar. They were preferred in 63% of subjects. Um, and then the stink bugs were the least preferred and the other three groups were in the middle. So basically this is um, their order of preference from left to right. And what surprised me here is that the smooth green caterpillars were not more popular with the birds um, because smooth green caterpillars make up such a, a big part of their natural diet. Um, and if I had to speculate, and so I will stress that this is just me speculating, I, I wasn't able to come up with a more sophisticated way to, to test this. Um, but um, I think this is because the green caterpillars had a high moisture content, which meant that they would decay very rapidly. So I was doing this in the summertime, they were in direct sunlight. And after being in the sun for 10 or 15 minutes, uh, the green caterpillars would turn into, you know, they would shrivel up and turn black. So they would look very different. And I I think if you're a bird, less appetizing than they did um, when they were live, because you know I wasn't able to put out live insects. They were all frozen and then set out um, fresh. Uh, well, 
you know, right out of the, the cooler um, onto the rooftop. Um, the other insects still maintained their lifelike appearance. So they still, um, you know, looked more or less as, as they did when they were alive. So if I could have found a, a way to capture the, the green, you know, lifelike vitality of these caterpillars, I suspect the birds would have liked them more. But again, I, I wasn't able to do that. So that's just speculation. So I'm going to totally shift gears here. Um, because uh, I had another uh, chapter of this dissertation, which is actually my favorite part to talk about. So I was, I was getting all this useful information about bluebirds, but that was still just one species and in one setting, you know, in Northern Delaware. So I wanted to be able to look at broader trends in different insect, or different bird groups across North America, excuse me. So, uh, Dr. Tallamy had the idea to crowdsource photos from, from other photographers, um, whether they're you know, professional or amateur, doesn't matter. Um, we set up this website called whatdidbirdseat.com. It was nice and easy to remember. Um, we explained what we were looking for and why, and just asked photographers to upload um, a photo of a bird with some type of arthropod in its prey and just some general information about when and where the photo was taken so we could add it to our database. Um, we also complemented it with a Facebook group which reached a slightly different audience, uh, but it was for the same purpose. Um, it was again called What Do Birds Eat? Um, and so over the, the several years that uh, those that site and that webpage were active, um, we uh, garnered about 7,000 photo submissions representing 322 North American bird species. And those photos came from all 50 states, as well as from uh, DC, um, most of the states of Mexico, most of the provinces of Canada as well. So this is my favorite part because um, I'm going to share some of my favorite photos that were submitted, not all 7,000. Uh, I wish I had time for that. Uh, but ju just a few, and I've got them arranged uh, phylogenetically, so I'm going to go through different bird families one at a time. Um, but first, just a general overview of what we found. So Lepidoptera, the, the caterpillars uh, and moths and butterflies, were the largest arthropod prey group for 15 of 20 examined bird families. And more than one in three of all the recorded bird arthropod interactions involved lepidopteran prey. And out of those lepidopteran prey, the vast majority of them were in the larval stage. So I think caterpillars are both a lot easier to catch and a lot more nutritious than adult moths and butterflies. So I'm going to start with the, the corvids, the crows and jays. Um, for each group, I'll show you a pie chart like the one we saw with the bluebirds, just showing you what the different groups were that uh, they fed on. And what I want you to pay attention to especially is the, the light green slice of pie, which is always going to correspond to Lepidoptera. So um, with the crows and jays, uh, it was about 15% of the diet was caterpillars. So not particularly high, but it's, it's gonna get higher for some of the other groups. So here's a blue jay with fall webworm in Quebec and a Stellar's jay with a caterpillar in California. And then just to mix it up, show some diversity, here's a Florida scrub jay with a centipede in Florida. <clears throat> Excuse me, moving on to the woodpeckers, we see now that uh, Lepidoptera has climbed up to 21%, so roughly a quarter of the diet. Um, and this was surprising to me because I had always associated woodpeckers with larval beetles, you know, getting under the, the bark. Uh, but that's not always the case. So uh, here's a downy woodpecker with a carpenter miller caterpillar in Ontario, uh, and a downy woodpecker with a beetle larva in Alabama. So that's more what I what I pictured as the quintessential woodpecker food. Um, and then here's a gila woodpecker with a honeybee in Arizona. So there were always some surprises. All right, the next group is the flycatchers. 
Uh, and with a name like Flycatcher, I expected the order Diptera, the true flies, to be a bigger percentage of their prey, but that was actually just 9% compared to 22%, which were Lepidoptera. So caterpillars are more important than flies to flycatchers. Um, this is based on 395 photos that were contributed. Uh, so here's an Eastern Phoebe with a fly in Delaware. Here is an olive-sided flycatcher with Horace's dusky wing uh, in Iowa. Uh, and then here's an Eastern wood peewee with a brown marmorated stink bug in Virginia. I include that one because someone always wants to know, did any of the birds eat the stink bugs? So it was not very common, but happened once in a while. All right, so moving on to the mockingbirds and allies. Uh, Lepidoptera, again, was the biggest uh, insect group for, for these birds at 29% of the diet. Here's a gray catbird with a caterpillar. Uh, here's a northern mockingbird with a variegated fritillary caterpillar in Texas and a long-billed thrasher with a caterpillar again in Texas. So you, you can see why this is my favorite part to share because uh, these photographers are you know, way more talented than, uh, than I could ever be. Um, so in the wrens, Lepidoptera made up more than a third of the diet. And this is based on 441 contributed photos. So here's a house wren with a caterpillar, a Carolina wren with a caterpillar, and a Buick's wren with a Katie did just to, just to mix it up. Moving on to the cardinals, again, we're seeing Lepidoptera making up more than a third of the diet. Here's a northern cardinal with a hawk moth caterpillar in Texas. Um, this picture I love. This looks like this summer tanager is bringing home like a what, what's the equivalent of a Thanksgiving turkey for, for them. So a luna moth caterpillar, one of the biggest caterpillars around uh, in Virginia. Uh, and a scarlet tanager with a bald-faced hornet in Illinois. Um, and I don't know why or if this was just an artifact of low sample size. Let me think. I had uh, 178 photos for this group, but uh, stinging insects were much, um, much more common in tanagers' diets than in other birds' diets. So I don't know if they've evolved some kind of behavioral mechanism or some kind of physiological mechanism uh, to avoid, um, you know, getting stung or being uh, impacted by the venom, but they they certainly didn't shy away from hornets like this one. Um, the blackbirds and orioles also um, preyed on Lepidoptera to the, the tune of about one in every three prey items based on 357 photos. Here's an eastern meadowlark with a Tursa sphinx moth caterpillar in Florida a Baltimore Oriole with a dagger moth caterpillar. And, and you can see some of these caterpillars are, are breaking the rule of being smooth green caterpillars. Some of them are quite spiny and hairy. Um, and some photographers submitted behavioral um, observations along with their photos. So multiple people commented on how when the bird had a particularly hairy or spiny caterp caterpillar, they would um, hit it against a branch or against the roof of the nest box, trying to dislodge those hairs. Um, before feeding it to their young. So uh, even though they will prey on them, it's taking a little bit more time and energy for them to, to process them relative to the smooth green caterpillars. So I still consider the smooth green ones the, the bird superfood. So on that note, this common grackle has a whole bill full of fall cankerworm uh, caterpillars, which some people consider a pest, but um, I think this goes to show that even the fall cankerworm has an important role to play in the ecosystem. Um, it's a very important bird food, especially as it's a, it's called the fall cankerworm, but the larvae, the caterpillars are emerging in the spring and it coincides perfectly with spring migration and the beginning of the breeding season. So, so I'm a big fan of the fall cankerworm. Uh, the thrushes um, are up next in this family. Uh, caterpillars made up about 44% of the diet. This is based on almost a thousand photos that were submitted, uh, which included a, a healthy dose of bluebird pictures. So here's a mountain bluebird with a caterpillar in Colorado, uh, a wood thrush 
with a caterpillar in Pennsylvania and an American robin with a lot of things going on here, um, but it includes an imperial moth caterpillar. That's the, the thing sticking out at the very end of the bill. There's also um, a cicada and an earthworm and a, another caterpillar in here too. Uh, warblers were the most popular group uh, as far as the, the number of photos that were submitted. So over a thousand photos for this group and caterpillars made up 51% of the diet. So here's a bay-breasted warbler with a caterpillar in Pennsylvania, a Kirtland's warbler with a caterpillar um, in Michigan, and a prothonotary warbler with, cater with multiple caterpillars and also a couple of true bugs in Virginia. Moving on to the cuckoos. Um, didn't have too many photos of cuckoos, only 66, but out of those 66 photos, 61% um, of the prey items were caterpillars. So here's a yellow-billed cuckoo with a Catalpa sphinx moth caterpillar in Ohio. Um, and then, um, sorry, when I said caterpillars, I should have just said Lepidoptera because that does include the adults as well. So here's an example of that, a greater roadrunner with a tobacco hawk moth out in Arizona. Um, and then just to mix it up, here's a mangrove cuckoo with a golden silk orb weaver spider in Florida. <laughs> All right, so the vireos are up next. And in this group, Lepidopter made up 62% of the diet. So you can see that green slice of the pie is getting bigger and bigger because um, uh, that's how I've stacked these photos. So uh, Cassin's vireo with a caterpillar in Arizona, a blue-headed vireo with a southern tussock moth caterpillar in Florida, and a red-eyed vireo with a spotted cucumber beetle in Maryland, just trying to mix it up. Next up is the New World Sparrows. Um, had a pretty uh, decent showing for this group, 575 contributed photos, and Lepidopter made up 65% of the diet in this group. Um, sorry, yeah. so here's a, a dark-eyed junco with uh, four different caterpillars in its bill um, in British Columbia, a spotted toey with a hornworm caterpillar in New Mexico, and a chipping sparrow with a variety of caterpillars and also a crane fly in New Brunswick. Uh, then the chickadees and titmice, the family parody. Uh, in this group, Lepidopter made up more than three quarters of the diet. So here's a Carolina chickadee in Virginia with a caterpillar. Tufted titmouse with a caterpillar in Virginia. Um, I feel like a lot of new parents can relate to the expression on this bird's face, but uh, as a scientist, it probably shouldn't be anthropomorphizing like that. Um, and then a, a bridled titmouse with a cicada in Arizona. So just to mix it up. All right, so a question I got, uh, especially from my graduate committee members was, you know, but does this actually work? So what they're asking is if you're just getting an assortment of randomly submitted photos from photographers, um, how do you know that it's actually showing uh, a representative sample of what the birds are eating? Because obviously um, people aren't going to capture every feeding event. And so we knew going into this that there might be some, some biases. Um, so for example, um, people will be more likely to notice and, and take a photo of, or especially a, a nice clear photo of larger insect prey um, and maybe have some other smaller insect groups be underrepresented. Um, so we thought a good way to test if this works is to take just the photos of Eastern bluebirds with their prey and compare the ones that were taken by my GoPro camera traps um, to the ones taken by actual human beings pushing the, the uh, you know, pushing the button. So, um, so comparing them, you can see that the, they actually line up shockingly well. So in both sets of photos, um, the caterpillars uh, and other Lepidoptera made up about 40% of the diet and, and was the, the largest group. Um, in both cases, Orthoptera, the crickets, grasshoppers, and katydids made up about a quarter of the diet, followed by the spiders at between 15 to 19 percent. Um, and when we ran statistical analyses to compare if these numbers were actually 
similar as opposed to just looking similar, um, there was no significant difference um, in those three big groups. Um, the only notable difference was in beetles, which made up only 3% uh, of the GoPro prey photos, but 11% of the community science photos. Um, and then in both groups, uh, Diptera, the true flies, was the, the fifth biggest insect group, or arthropod group, I should say. Um, so I was very impressed by how well this works. So it goes to show that if you have a large enough data set, so a large enough team of community scientists, um, you really can get useful, meaningful data about um, certainly bird diets. You can probably apply this to other aspects of bird behavior or bird ecology as well. So it's just a really encouraging sign that community science works um, and it's, it's helpful. And, uh, you know, we, we learned so much more than I would have learned just with my, my one study site in Delaware. So yeah, the pie chart on the right, even though it's just 500 photos compared to the 7,000 plus um, in Delaware, um, uh, they represent the, the whole breeding range of the Eastern Bluebird. So if I had to speculate why caterpillars are so important to birds, um, based on the reading I've done in the literature, there's, there's studies showing that they really are the perfect bird food as I, I keep coming back to. And that's for a number of reasons. They're low in, in chitin. Chitin is um, not very easy for birds to digest. So less is better for the birds. Um, they're high in fat and in protein and in a variety of micronutrients, including calcium, potassium, vitamin E, and vitamin A, and they're full of carotenoids. And um, the, the last part of my project was uh, touching on that last bit. Um, we predicted that um, varying levels of carotenoids in different insect groups um, made them more or less attractive to the birds. So here are some reasons carotenoids are important. They, they stimulate the immune system, they improve color vision. So they're actually a precursor um, to vitamin A, which is important in vision. So uh, for example, if, if you remember like being a little kid and your parents told you to eat your carrots because they would improve your eyesight, there's actually some truth to that. So carrots are full of beta carotene, which is a carotenoid. Um, and they increase sperm vitality and they protect DNA from oxidative damage. And all of these benefits, by the way, these, these are for all vertebrates. These are all reasons um, that vertebrates need carotenoids. This last one, number five, is just important to the birds and not so much for us. Um, carotenoids produce red, orange, and yellow pigments in plumage. So that's important to birds because it's um, showing a, a signal of how healthy and vital they are to prospective mates. So we wanted to test the carotenoid levels in different insect groups. So um, with some, some colleagues in the entomology department, um, I collected as many different insects as I could. So I had a combination of methods just to try and target different insect groups. Um, and then I sent all the insects to a lab at Arizona State University uh, where Dr. Kevin McGraw did what's called um, high-performance liquid chromatography which is a way to basically um, separate and identify the different components in a substance. So here um, is the carotenoid content across the different invertebrate groups that we sampled. So you can see that uh, sawflies, which um, are actually hymenoptera, but they, in their larval stage, they look very much like caterpillars. So the larval sawflies and caterpillars um, were much higher in carotenoid content than all of the other groups. So I've got them arranged here from most to least uh, carotenoids. Um, so, so there's sawflies, caterpillars, um, orthoptera, the crickets and grasshoppers, the true flies, which included uh, crane flies. I've split up adult moths and butterflies from the caterpillars, I've got um, some earwigs, some spiders, some ants and other hymenoptera, some true bugs, including stink bugs, some harvestmen or daddy long legs, praying mantises, beetles, millipedes and centipedes, and earthworms. And comparing uh, the carotenoid content to how frequently they're consumed by um, Eastern bluebirds, you can see that caterpillars are at the, the top of the chart for, for both of these things, right? So there is a trend here where 
um, the higher the carotenoid content, the more popular these groups were um, as bird food. Um, you know, there, there were some exceptions, but that was the overall trend. So it, it's probably not the only reason, but we think it's, it's a contributing reason as to why uh, birds depend so heavily on caterpillars. So just to kind of sum up, we learned that caterpillars are very important to birds. We already knew from the literature going into this that they're extremely host specific. So about 90% of them are host plant specialists. So they need native plants to survive. So as our landscapes become invaded with non-native plants, um, those plants aren't suitable habitat for caterpillars and caterpillars will begin to drop out and become locally um, extinct. Um, so I'll uh, point your attention to another paper that came out of our lab. I wasn't involved with this one, um, but it was my, my colleague Desiree, who is fantastic uh, working uh, with Doug Talamy and Kimberly Shropshire. Um, and they have this fantastic uh, comic strip that just kind of summarizes um, these points. So uh, I'll just move through this. Uh, so they found that uh, across the United States, just a very, a relatively small number of plants support the majority of caterpillar species. So it's about 14% of plant genera were supporting 90% of the caterpillars. Um, so they designated um, these most important genera as the keystone plants in the ecosystem. So they included oaks, willows, cherry, pines, and poplar. So this is useful because if you're working with a limited space or limited budget, you're trying to think, you know, what few actions could I take to really boost the, the value of my you know, backyard wildlife habitat? Um, you know, you can focus on these keystone plants that will more efficiently restore insect diversity and support the animals that depend on insects for survival. Um, and a tool that you might already be familiar with, but uh, it's a really easy first step towards deciding what's a plant. Um, it's the National Wildlife Federation's Native Plant Finder. Um, it's very user-friendly. You just punch in your zip code and it will populate a list for you of both the flowers and grasses in your region that support the most insect species, as well as um, a, a separate list of the trees that will support the most insects. So there's a little number by each one, with the butterfly logo that tells you um, the number of species uh, that that uh, plant will support. So this is kind of a joke, but it's called the 10-step the program for bug control. If you see insects feeding on your plant, take 10 steps away from the plant. And if you can't see the insect damage from that vantage point, then you probably don't need to do anything. <laughs> um, that, that's obviously a very healthy, vibrant tree, even though it might have, um, and it likely does have lots of caterpillars and other insects feeding on it. Uh, so I'm going to share my favorite quote from one of my favorite childhood books, The Little Prince. It says, well, I must endure the presence of a few caterpillars if I wish to become acquainted with the butterflies. So there's a really important message there about tolerance of uh, insects that we used to perceive as pests. So applying all of this to our landscapes, my, my hope here is that we can transition from landscapes that look like this one, which it's admittedly very um, tidy, but it also looks very, very sterile. I mean, you know, imagine being a, a parent chickadee, and you've got a nest in one of those trees, and you've got to find thousands of caterpillars in order to, to raise one clutch of chicks. You're not going to be able to find them in a landscape that looks like this one. So this is really um, a food desert to birds. Um, so I hope we can transition from those to uh, landscapes that look more like this. So this yard, I think, is even more beautiful, and it's certainly a lot more interesting and colorful. And I think if I were a chickadee in this yard, I would be very happy, and my my babies would be very well fed. So if we want to conserve birds, we have to plant a wide variety of native plants. So with that, I um, just wanted to thank everyone who contributed um, in one way or another to this research, um, especially the army of more than 1,200 community scientists who contributed photos.
And thank you so much for your time and attention. I think I went over time a little bit. I got a little carried away talking about this, uh, but I, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy. That was absolutely amazing presentation, and especially considering you just got back from Kenya. <laughs> you made it even more amazing. Thank you. Um, You're too kind. No, uh, we have a few questions in the uh, ch chat box. Um, I, I would like to take the president's pr prerogative and ask you one, though. Um, you mentioned the different ways, uh, the, the different uh, methods that had been used in the past to look at what kind of insects uh, birds ate. Uh, did you go back and look to see how their results differed from yours and whether it showed that, in fact, different kinds of insects are disappearing? Um, so, uh, yes. Um, and what I, what I noticed was they overrepresented those groups that are um, not as easily digested. So in our photos, we've seen a much, much smaller um, proportion of ants and beetles um, compared to what was already in the literature. Um, and, you know, and that that could be due to you know, regional variation. I mean, there could be populations of birds out there that do, based on their habitat, um, feed more selectively on those groups. But I think it's really an artifact of, um, you know, they're more likely to, to turn up in the fecal matter or in the gut, um, uh, whereas the, the caterpillars are gonna basically be uh, unrecognizable at that same stage in the digestive process. Um, Great, thank you. So we have a question from John. How many bluebird nests did you monitor? And a really pedestrian question, how did you call through 25,000 photos a day from each nest? Did you have assistance or was there a software program that helped? Um, so that's a good question. <laughs> so over the three years, it was about um, 40 different nests that I monitored. Um, and uh, so going through the photos, um, I tried different software programs that were, th the way that they work is you're supposed to feed in like a, a starter picture that's like a, a, a frame of reference to compare the other photos to, and then the, the software will identify the photos that are uh, noticeably different so that, and separate them. But I found that it didn't work because um, you know, I wanted it to just highlight the photos that had birds in them, but it would also just set aside uh, pictures where um, uh, the wind is moving a tree in the background a certain way, or, or the sun and clouds are like moving across the sky, so they look different for that reason. And so, so the software fell through for me, um, but what I would do is when I uploaded the photos to my computer, I would um, display um, dozens or even hundreds of them at a time in you know, tiny little thumbnails and just scroll through them. Um, and it was it was easy to see when you had a bird alight on the roof, um, there would be you know, a series of you know, maybe five to 30 pictures in a row with a bird. And so it would jump out at me even in the little thumbnail version. So yeah, just lots of scrolling. I would have loved to have an assistant, but we didn't have the funding for that. So <laughs> uh, it was, yeah, it was a, a labor of love. Uh, well, you're getting tons and tons of kudos. Uh... Uh, in yeah. the chat box, by the way. And we have uh, another question here. Should I change my plants to ones that feed more caterpillars? For example, replacing an elderberry with a prairie willow. Uh, so I will, I'll go ahead and say I'm not a plant person, so I'm, I'm not a good resource for specific recommendations, but, um, but absolutely uh, I would support, um, you know, upgrading your yard into better bird habitat by, you know, figuring out which which plants for your area are the best at supporting caterpillars. So that um, National Wildlife Federation Native Plant Finder is a great resource. Um, there are, I mean, even so. Since I graduated, um, Dr. Talmy has um, put together. Have you heard of a homegrown national park? And uh, yeah, so his website has some great resources there. Um, and and you're you know, luckily. Um, with you being in, in Maryland, um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, his, his research is focused mostly in the Eastern United States. So everything that um, has come out of his lab is very pertinent and applicable for, for Maryland as well. Uh, 
Great, thank you. So uh, anyone else have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. Again, getting tons more. Uh, people just love the presentation. They're really fascinated by it. Thank you. Um, well, we'll let you escape um, and, and have some sleep after your long flight. Thank you so, so, so much for this. This was just absolutely fascinating and we all learned a ton. Thank you so much. It was it was a, a pleasure to, to meet you all, if, if only virtually. <laughs> and thanks everybody for joining us.